Assalamu alaikum, shalom alaikum, greetings of peace and blessings to all. I'm honored to be here before you and in the presence of the esteemed rabbi uh, to fill in and just begin to shed a little bit of light on the a few of the beautiful and significant Islamic holidays that mark important moments in the lives of Muslims around the world. Uh, the joyous occasions provide an opportunity for us to come together, reflect on our faith, and strengthen the bonds of our communities. Islam encompasses a rich tapestry of traditions and observances, and while there are numerous Islamic holidays for the sake of time and brevity, I would like to focus on two major celebrations, being Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, and one of the major events connected to Eid al-Fitr, which is Ramadan. Firstly, I'll briefly discuss the Islamic calendar. The calendar is a lunar calendar. It follows the monthly cycles of the moon and its phases. It contains 12 months made up of 354 or 355 days. The years in the Islamic calendar begin with the year 622 of the common area on the Gregorian calendar. This marks the year in which the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, peace be upon him, emigrated from Mecca to Medina and established the first official Muslim community in an event known as the Hijrah. So for example, today, June 14th, 2023 of the Common Era would be the 25th of the in the year 1444 Anno Hegerai, which is the year of the Hijrah. The Islamic calendar uses the phases of the sun to determine uh, the start date, excuse me, the phase of the moon, apologies, to determine the start date of the months and the dates of some of the seminal events of the Muslim year, some of which we will see next. Uh, the first holiday we're looking at here is uh, Eid al-Fitr, which translated from the Arabic means the festival or celebration of the breaking of the fast. Um, this is because Eid al-Fitr follows the holy month of Ramadan, which is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar, and the practices of Ramadan run out through the entirety of the month. Uh, and I'm sure many of us know someone who has partaken in or have partaken ourselves in the festivities of Ramadan. I'll briefly go over it and its practices and significances. Again, the Islamic calendar is a lunar calendar, so it determines the beginnings of each month by the sighting of the crescent moon. Um, as such, Ramadan falls on a different Gregorian date each year, typically shifting between 20, 10 and 12 days, and subsequently lasting between 29 and 30 days. So the question then becomes, what exactly is it that Muslims do during Ramadan? Uh, perhaps most famously, during the month of Ramadan, Muslims are instructed to fast, and that fast would be from food, beverage, sexual relations, and general sinfulness between sunrise and sunset, rather devoting themselves to prayer, recitation of the Quran, the remembrance of God, and reflection. And I, I know we're all kind of dying to ask the question, does that also mean water? And indeed, it does mean water. No water during fasting as well. Um, fasting during Ramadan is one of the five pillars of Islam, alongside the Shahada, or the Statement of Belief in Allah's Messenger, observance of the five daily obligatory prayers, zakat, or the donation of one's wealth annually, uh, a fraction of one's wealth, and the performance of the Hajj pilgrimage. Um, and I know what many may be thinking now. It, that's got to be some holiday, right? Slogging through the day, deprived of bodily sustenance. Quite joyous. Uh, but indeed, for Muslims, it's the most joyous of occasions because of what Ramadan represents. It's the commemoration of the first revelation of the Quran to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by the angel Jibril, or uh, Gabriel, in the cave of Hira near Mecca. Uh, briefly, this, this occurred during the year 610 of the Common Era, and according to a, a narration in Sahih al-Bukhari, one of the largest collections of sayings and practices of the Prophet, peace be upon him, while in the cave, Jibril came before the Prophet and said to him, Iqra, read, to which the Prophet said he did not know how. Now, following a tight embrace from Jibril, the cycle repeated twice more until the Prophet began to receive and repeat the first revelations of the Quran, which are the first five ayahs or the verses of Surah number 96, Al-Alaq, the clot. Uh, this revelation is narrated to have occurred during a very sacred night known as Laylatul Qadr, the night of power. This was the night in which the Prophet received his revelation, the night where the Quran was sent from the heaven to the earth and then dispersed piecemeal to the Prophet over the course of 23 years. Uh, but more on Laylatul Qadr later on. Now, Allah describes the month of Ramadan in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah of the Qur'an, verse number 185, when he says, uh, and I'll scope the English for time's sake, Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed as a guide for humanity with clear proofs of guidance and the standard to distinguish between right and wrong. So whoever is present this month, let him fast. But whoever is ill or on a journey, let them fast. An equal number of days after Ramadan. Allah intends ease for you, not hardship, so that you may complete the prescribed period and proclaim the greatness of Allah for guiding you, and perhaps you will be grateful. As we can see here, fasting is prescribed upon all Muslims, but there are some exceptions for specific individuals to delay their fast uh, for, due to hardship to be made up for later on. Uh, some of these examples would, be, would be include the traveler, the elderly, the ill, the diabetic, uh, the breastfeeding mother, or the menstruating woman. Um, for those that are required to fast during the month, there are a few key things to note. Um, firstly, prior to the fast, uh, generally Muslims will begin uh, with a pre-dawn meal known as suhoor, which is conducted before the dawn period of Fajr. 
Uh, that's the final meal that is had prior to the sunset meal that breaks the fast, and that's known as iftar, which is eaten after the sunset prayer of Maghrib. During the fasting hours, whilst abstaining from the prohibited acts previously mentioned, extra emphasis is given towards prayer, remembrance of Allah, providing acts of charity, strengthening one's discipline, listening to and reciting the Qur'an, and finding time for refle reflection. Um, and this is from uh, one of the hadith or the sayings of the Prophet وسلم, which was recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari, in which he says, regarding the fasting person, Allah says, he has left his food, drink, and desires for my sake, the fast is for me, so I will reward the fasting person for it, and the reward of good deeds is multiplied ten times. Uh, the incentive here, if you will, is for amplifying one's fast with positive actions and good deeds is quite literally tenfold during Ramadan. As such, there are two additional components that are also incorporated into daily Muslim life during Ramadan. Uh, one being the Tarawih prayer, and the other being completing the reading of the Qur'an. Tarawih means uh, rest or relaxation, and as we know quite well, there's nothing more relaxing after a long day of fasting than standing still for two hours. Um, <laughs> I'm just joking, of course. The Tarawih prayer is rest and relaxation for one's mind and one's soul. It's a way of furthering one's connection with God through the recitation of his word and steadfastness in his worship. And the Tarawih prayer itself consists of 20 cycles or raka'ahs in sets of two following the Isha or nightly prayer. Each night, the Imam will typically recite one chapter or juz of the Qur'an so that once Ramadan is complete, the entire Qur'an will have been recited. Uh, while they're not compulsory like the five daily prayers, uh, they are strongly encouraged as a confirmed practice or sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Similarly, another non-compulsory practice is to read the entirety of the Qur'an throughout the month of Ramadan, similarly to Tarawih, but just reading a chapter each day as you are able to do so. And the last thing I'll talk about regarding Ramadan is the Laylatul Qadr, the night of power. Again, it was the night in which the Prophet uh, received his first revelation from God through his intermediary, the angel Gabriel. The exact date of Laylatul Qadr is unknown, but it is known to fall on one of the odd-numbered nights in the final 10 days of Ramadan. Uh, so it would be either the 21st, 23rd, 25th, 27th, or 29th night. Many do pay special attention to the 27th night and believe it to be the most probable. Uh, and the blessings of Laylatul Qadr are incomparable. And in Surah number 97 in the Quran, um, Al-Qadr, verse number 3, Allah says, Laylatul Qadr is khayrun min alfi shahr. The night of power is better than a thousand months. Uh, so, therefore, the rewards of acts of worship and Laylatul Qadr cannot really be replicated on another night, and as such, Muslims around the world will gather on these nights, standing in congregational prayers, performing extra optional prayers, reading the Qur'an, supplicating to God, and reflecting on and remembering Him, and worshiping God throughout the entirety of the night. Uh, and I know that was a lot, but believe it or not, that was just a very brief and basic overview of Ramadan. And we'll look at the culmination now of Ramadan, which is Eid al-Fitr, the celebration of the breaking of the fast. Eid al-Fitr falls immediately after the month of Ramadan on the first day of the 10th month, known as Shawal. Eid al-Fitr is commemorated with a special prayer that is performed in a large congregation and slightly different than the daily prayer since it includes additional takbirs, which is the raising of the hands accompanied by saying the words Allahu Akbar. The Eid prayer is conducted in two cycles or raqahs and is then accompanied by a sermon from the Imam, uh, which is distinct from the routine Friday or Jum'ah prayers, which include a sermon, but it's concluded is conducted prior to the cycles of the prayer. Uh, there are some sunnahs or confirmed practices of the Prophet regarding the Eid prayer, such as taking a full body purification bath prior to attending, dressing in the finest clothes, eating an odd number of dates prior to attending the prayer, and taking a different path home from the prayer that one took to the prayer. Um, now, prior to the Eid prayer, it's incumbent on the Muslim to pay an additional charity, uh, known as the Fitr. It can be paid prior to the, the required period, but it must be paid prior to the prayer. Uh, it can be paid, the Zakat, conversely, can be paid any time. But the payment of the fitr is the way for the fasting Muslim to show thanks to Allah for enabling them to complete their observance of the fast and in a way to assist the poor and the needy. Upon completion of the Eid prayer, Muslims will then embrace one another with greetings of Eid Mubarak, Blessed Eid, Happy Eid, not really Merry Eid, but you know, similar. Uh, during Eid, it's a time for forgiveness, a time where Muslims repair any broken bonds they have with one another, asking for forgiveness, forgiving one another for past transgressions, and removing the enmity between one another if there is any. Um, of course, Eid is accompanied with a copious quantities of delicious foods and sweets, which after a month of fasting is tr quite the welcome sight, trust me. Uh, the remainder of the Eid celebration then will, will vary between cultures, but commonly includes spending the day with uh, the presence of family, eating delicious, sometimes special foods. If you haven't had Kabuli Palau, try it on, on Eid, it's very good. Um, enjoying the company of one another, decorating one's home or neighborhood, giving gifts and sweets to children, and partaking in festivals or group activities that the community puts on. Uh, many Muslim-majority countries will also shut down schools and businesses in observance of Eid so that the families can be together and celebrate the joyous occasion. 
Eid al-Fitr reminds us of the importance of compassion, sharing, and the joy of coming together as a family. Uh, and, and one more celebration we'll look at here is Eid al-Adha. Uh, the first day of Eid al-Adha actually aligns with the third day of the Hajj, both being on the 10th day of the month of dhul Hijjah, which is the one or the month of the pilgrimage, and that's the 12th and final month of the Islamic calendar. And I wanted to speak a little bit on the Hajj, but that would take a, a very long time, so I'll go ahead and forego that and just we'll, we'll talk about Eid al-Adha and I'll, I'll call it a day here. Um, so Eid al-Adha, which is actually coming up here towards the end of the month, is uh, translated as the Festival of the Sacrifice, and it commemorates the, the Qurbani sacrifice. Um, on the 10th day of the Hijjah, it is the major event that is celebrated is the ritual slaughter of an animal. This animal can be a goat, a cow, a sheep, a lamb, or a camel, and is ideally distributed in three parts equally, one for consumption of the family, one for friends and extended family, and one for the poor and the needy. Now in lieu of slaughtering the animal themselves, which it can be quite difficult, I'm not really exactly a master at it yet, but you know, we're, we're working on it. Um, you can arrange to have the animal slaughtered, sometimes overseas, in which case the entirety of the sacrificial meat would then be distributed amongst the poor. Uh, what's distinct here about the slaughtering of the animals for the Qurbani is the discarding of the blood of the animal and the lack of any burnt offerings accompanying it. Now this sacrifice is acceptable between the 10th and the 13th of the Hijjah. Um, and for the reason behind the Qurbani, it's a symbol, a symbolical replication of the story of Ibrahim or uh, Abraham alayhi salam and his son. In the Quran in Surah number 37, as safat it means those who set the ranks, verses 102 to 109, the story of that is relayed, where Abraham sees in a dream that he must sacrifice his son, now, most of you say that this is Ishmael, but it's not, he's not explicitly named in the text. And, and one quick note about that is that the Quran doesn't exactly elaborate upon the identity of the son, as it's not the point of the narrative. The Quran itself does not delve into the details of the sacred narratives in the way that the Tanakh typically does, but rather it draws out the overarching and structural lessons of the narrative. Um, so here, upon telling his son about the dream, uh, his son willingly accepts the ultimate destiny and lays on his side of his forehead for sacrifice. At that point, God calls out to Abraham and informs him that he has fulfilled the dream and that this was just a test for him. God then provides a ram to be sacrificed instead as a ransom for his son, and that is now remembered with the Qurani sacrifice. On Eid al-Adha, similar to Eid al-Fitr, the prayer is held consisting of two cycles of prayer uh, with the additional takbirs and uh, the following of the prayer with the sermon. Uh, and then after each of the five um, obligatory daily prayers between the Fajr or dawn prayer on the 9th of the Hijjah, and the Asr of the 13th of the Hijjah, the Sunset Prayer. The Muslims will additionally say the Takbir out loud in the following manner, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest. There's no God but Allah. Allah is the greatest, Allah is the greatest, and to Allah goes all praise. Um, the festivities are similar with the traditions of Eid al-Fitr, um, like greeting one another with Eid al-Barak, visiting and embracing family and friends, exchanging of gifts, partaking of sweets and foods, but it's also a time to reflect on the blessings that we have and an opportunity to share with those in need. Eid al-Adha really encourages us to be compassionate, selfless, and prioritize the welfare of others. Um, and if you haven't partaken in an Eid celebration, I would highly recommend it if presented with the opportunity. It's a, it's a wonderful experience and a great time to connect with loved ones and, and celebrate. Um, and just to, in closing here, you know, Islamic holidays, they provide us with the moments of celebration, spiritual growth, and community building. They serve as reminders of our values and principles. They emphasize the importance of love, compassion, sacrifice, and self-reflection. Whether it's the celebration of Eid al-Fitr or the spirit of sacrifice during Eid al-Adha, the holidays pretend to bring Muslims closer to their faith and to one another. And with that, I will see the rest of my time, and I thank you all for listening. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Omar. So you'll take some questions now? Okay, great. Um, I'll just bring the microphone over to whoever has a question. Ruth? I am Jewish, and our holidays start the night before the day of the holiday. How, when do Muslim holidays start? Yeah, so I should have clarified that actually. Um, is this one on? Um, it's sort of the Maghrib, which is like at the sunset. The sunset. At sunset. Yeah. Okay, so they start the day before too. Yeah, the sunset. Time. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I meant to mention that. Okay. Who else has a question? Alan? Yeah, I was just wondering with these. Um, you know, when when you when you break the fast during the day or at the end, is there a ritual? 
statement, like a Passover statement, where you remember what's going on? Is there a, you know, a, just a formalized, ritualized statement that goes with this? Not exactly like the Passover statement. No, it really just sort of varies. Um, first, first, you make a supplication as you see feet, but not not specific like the Passover statement is. Who else has a question? I actually have one question. I oh, think okay. you said that um, you break the fast by eating an odd number of dates. Is that right, or an uh, uneven so number? So it's a it's a practice of the prophet uh, to eat not in odd numbers of dates. Yeah, odd numbers of dates, and that's actually was when going to the eat prayer, I'm going to the eat prayer to eat um, an odd number of dates prior to um, going to the prayer itself. And it's a it's a sunnah, so it's a following in the in the tradition of the prophet. Okay, thanks. That's Carolyn. Hi. Um, you mentioned a delicious dish that you eat. Eat. What is that? It's an Afghan dish. It's called kabuli palau. It's a. It consists of rice, meat, carrots, raisins, and sometimes pistachios. Very, very delicious, in my opinion. Okay. Thank you. It's better than it sounds. Trust me. The carrots and raisins are like caramelized, so it, it's definitely much better than typically. Carolyn will make a note of that. <laughs> Oh, delicious, right? <laughs> okay. Right. Ruth, do you have another question? Okay, here comes the microphone. I was curious about uh, why um, the, the Muslim calendar, um, well, Ramadan, which I'm familiar with, um, sometimes is in November, sometimes is in July. Yeah. It, it just varies so much. Yeah throughout the year and you know we're on a lunar calendar too mm -hmm. but i don't know why you know the holidays vary like you know maybe a month or so every year they're not always the same yeah but somehow they they stay in the same uh part of the year right right so um so the lunar calendar for us so it goes about 10 to 12 years back each year but the months tend to stay the same um it's they just the Gregorian date moves 10 to 12 days back for the whole year, like per year. So I don't mind, I let the rabbi elaborate upon the, the Jewish calendar, um, but for our calendar, it goes about 10 to 12 days back each year. So that's why it goes season to season. It's actually possible to have Ramadan twice in a year. Um, I, there's calculation, I don't remember what it's coming up, but um, it's possible to have it at the end of the year and then at the beginning of the year at the same time, like two separate Ramadans that overlap. So because the calendar shifts 10 to 12 days. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, if you think of something, maybe at the very end you could ask them. All right, let's give another round of applause to Amar. And now, Rabbi Judith Side from Tri-Valley Cultural Jews. Standing up because I'm short. Are we good? Okay. okay, the Jewish calendar. The the Jewish calendar is really when you know the Jewish calendar, you know the history of the Jewish people. It's um, it's messy. It changes all the time. It's inventive and. Sometimes different people have holidays that are longer or shorter or even individual. Um, there are things about the Jewish calendar that would be recognizable to, to you, like uh, we have a seven-day week. Not every culture does. Um, like Baha'i and um, like the Muslim calendar, um, our days start at nightfall. Um, like the Baha'i, we have a spring new year, sort of. Um, and it's, it's lunar solar, like the Hindu calendar. It's usually 12 months. Um, that's where it kind of all goes off the rails. Um, because when you're an ancient um, culture, 
you've got lots of different um, influences and you have a herding, a herding culture, and you also have a farming culture. And herding cultures are lunar and farming cultures are solar. So we had to make some kind of arrangement whereby the seasonal holidays had to come at the right season, but we also had to use the moon for our months. And so like the ancient Babylonians, the um, solution was to add some months. We add a, um, a second last month of the year, Adar, in the spring. And we, um, we do that seven times every 19 years, the third, sixth, eighth, 11th, 14th, 17th, and 19th years of the 19 year cycle. But it's not that easy um, because some of our holidays cannot happen on a Friday or a Sunday because they are fasts, which I will get to. And you can't have a fast the day before the day you can't cook. And you can't have a fast the day after the day you can't cook. And you can't cook on, um, on our Sabbath, which is Saturday. So um, as a result, we sometimes add a month or subtract, uh, no, add a day or subtract a day from a couple of months. Um, and as a result of all of this finagling around, which got finally um, kind of uh, solidified in the 700s. Um, as a result of that, uh, Jewish years can be 353, 354, 355, 383, 384, or 385 days. This is why we always have a printed calendar around, because we have no Second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, only the seventh day, the Shabbat, the Sabbath, has a name. Um, and this has, I think, to do with our horror of idolatry. That the names of the months, although they are adopted from the Babylonian names, are not generally associated with gods. But, for instance, in English and in a number of other of other languages, the names of the days are associated with various gods, and we're not, we're not having that. This is not what we're going to do. Um, we do celebrate the new moon. It's a kind of a minor holiday that has been kind of recovered as a women's holiday just in the last probably 60 years, 50 or 60 years. This is typical of Jewish holidays, is we keep reinterpreting our traditions and our holidays um, in order to make them responsive to our environment and what's going on in the world and where we live. Um, I should say there are also holidays, I'll, I'll go through the actual holidays pretty quickly. But there are holidays that are celebrated only in some communities. Um, some people celebrate holidays for one day, some for two. Uh, the holidays that are celebrated in individual communities are often kind of redemption days. Um, they will be called a Purim after the holiday of Purim in which uh, Jews were saved from extermination. So sometimes if a a small community somewhere in the world has been saved from some kind of extinction event. Um, they will have their own Purim. Um, we also have individual holidays. For instance, we mark the death anniversary of um, members of our family. It's called a, in Yiddish we call it a yard site, which means a year time. Um, and so every family is your celebrates different yard sites. 
and on those days we generally um, light a 24-hour candle. Um, if you are religious, you might go to a synagogue and um, recite uh, Kaddish, which is the prayer that religious Jews recite when somebody dies or when they remember them. Uh, our holidays, some of them are family holidays and some of them are community holidays. And all of them have some variety of seasonal, kind of primitive, um, historic, religious, national, and kind of ethical qualities to them. And some holidays are, you know, more seasonal, some holidays are more historical, but they all have more than one meaning to them. And this makes it um, very convenient because um, you may know that if you have two Jews in a room, you've got three opinions. So um, there's something in our holidays for all of us, for, for each of us to, um, to connect with. Um, some of our holidays are really ancient, um, from royal times, a thousand BC or so, when, when there were um, kings in ancient Israel, Israel and Judea. Um, others of them come from what we call priestly times when there were temples in Jerusalem. Others are from rabbinic times. We're kind of in rabbinic times still now, um, dating from around the turn of the Christian millennium, around um, maybe 100 BCE. Um, and some of them are just modern holidays that celebrate now that because things happen and we have to have ways to celebrate them. So I will I will go through our year. Um, there's only one of the 12 months in, in the Jewish year that does not have any holidays. And in the fall we've got like five. Um, it's exhausting. So our First holidays is called Rosh Hashanah, uh, which means Rosh is the head, and Shana is the year. Rosh Hashanah um, is our new year, and our new year comes on the first day of the seventh month. And um, I, I see you are looking confused <laughs> because this is confusing. This is one of the compromises that's made between herding. because our first month is in the spring. The ancient new year is in the spring, because of course it is, because that's when the little lambs and the little, the little goaties, or what are those called, kids, are, are born, and that's the beginning of things in a, in a herding community. In a farming community in the Middle East, the most important thing is whether there is going to be rain. So, a, um, a time when you expect that the rains will start would be the time that you would be really paying attention. And so that's how the new year ended up in the seventh month. Ten days after Rosh Hashanah is Yom Kippur, or Yom Kippur if you have my accent in Yiddish. Um, and that is a day of atonement. That's a 24-hour fast. We don't fast for a whole month, <laughs> but we do fast for 24 hours, and um, we have this concept called a hedge around the Torah, which means just to be sure, we fast for 25 hours. Um, and that is a no food, no drink, nothing fast. Um, however, like uh, Muslim fasts, there are exceptions. Pregnant women may not fast. If you are sick, you um, if you are traveling, it is better to stop traveling and fast, but if you can't, you can't. And so you can make it up the same, you know, the same idea at another time. Um, and that is a day when religious Jews will spend most of the day in the synagogue. Um, it's a day that you get right with other people, you get right with God. 
Um, but you cannot get right with God unless you have gotten right with other people. There, you must, during the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you must apologize and make amends to anybody that you've wronged. And that person is obligated to forgive you if you ask. Um, and you, you kind of give up your grudges. And that's, you know, for me, that's the important part of the day because I am not a religious person. Um, but for a lot of uh, for a lot of Jews, it's you know um, starting the year right. There is an ancient ancient uh, prayer about um, how who will die in the next year and how they might how they might perish. It's a very scary day. It, it was a very scary day for, for some people. And then a month later, we've got the harvest holiday of Sukkot. And that's the first fruits. And we build a little temporary hut and eat in it. Some people sleep in it. Um, at the end of the seven-day period, there are three holidays that come right upon each other. Some people celebrate to the same day, and some don't. These are um, Shemini Atziris, Hashanah Rabbah, and Simchas Torah. Hashanah Rabbah is the day when you pray for rain. And we have this um, kind of, it's a, uh, you get a palm branch, and you have myrtle and willow, and you wind them all up, and then you beat it on the ground, and because, because you know how a palm branch does, a dry palm branch, it sounds like rain. It's sympathetic magic. You're saying, hey, do this, do this. And um, it's fun. We, we don't really think it brings the rain. But it's, you know, it's an ancient tradition, so why not? And then Simchas Torah is when we start the yearly reading of the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Jewish Bible. Um, and it is read in the, in the synagogue Monday, Thursday, Saturday. And um, it's read throughout the year. And because sometimes we have two months of Adar, on years that we don't have two months of Adar, we got to double up some of the portions so that sometimes it's really long. Anyway, on Simchas Torah, um, the Torah is usually on a double scroll, and one of them gets bigger and one of them gets smaller as you go through it. Um, and in the synagogue, they will finish reading, and then um, if you're lucky enough to have two Torahs, you take out another one that somebody has re-rolled already and start reading the, the um, first part. Otherwise, you have to you know, roll it all. Um, and that's a festive occasion. Um, the idea is that you never finish learning. You stop and then you just start right over again and you'll find something new. You'll find something new every time um, in what you're reading. Um, in the spring, early spring, we have Tu Bishvat, which is another ancient holiday. It's when the sap rises in the trees in the Middle East. It's actually a tax holiday. If, you're, if your tree is old enough to have borne fruit, then you owe taxes on it. Um, we haven't used it that way since, uh, you know, 70 CE. Um, but we still, you know, we still want to celebrate the holiday. And so throughout the last 2,000 years, we've celebrated different days, and now it's our Earth Day. It's the day that a lot of congregations will do something, um, plant trees. I mean, we're still with the trees. Um, plant trees or do something um, to help, you know, the ecology. It's our, it's our ecological holiday now. Um, in the early spring comes Purim. I mentioned that. That's the, if you've read the Book of Esther, that's the holiday that comes from the Book of Esther. 
the Book of Esther is horrifying. Uh, we don't, we don't tell our children the whole story. We, we stop before the massacre, and we don't really explain how Esther got chosen to be the queen. Um, but kids will dress up, and in times past, or in communities where there are a lot of Jews in one place, they will bring around treats called shalach manot, shalach manis in my accent. Um, they bring around treats, um, cookies, um, candy, homemade stuff around to other people in their, in their community. And they'll dress up as the people in the story. And that's, it's kind of like a reverse Halloween. Um, in the late spring is the Passover. That's another um, seven or eight day holiday and that commemorates the exodus from Egypt. It's not a historical truth. It is, an, it is a moral truth. It is the founding myth of the Jewish people that once we were slaves and now we are free and we learn from that that we didn't really like being slaves and neither does anybody else. And that it is our responsibility to, um, to create a just world. Um, there's a big dinner, um, a long ceremony. This is a family ceremony, not a, not a community ceremony. Um, and during this holiday, we, many Jews don't eat any leavened food. So they eat matzah, which is a cracker. Um, no bread, um, no vinegar, no beer, um, no cake, you know, nothing with yeast or any leavening. Um, because the story says that um, when it came time for the Jews to leave Egypt, um, there was a sign on their doorpost, somebody blood of a lamb on their doorposts and they knew this is the day we're going but they didn't know in advance so they didn't have time to bake bread so the bread didn't rise and it was flat and that's matzah and that's the story of why we don't eat leavened food for those seven days um, if you are a Jew of North African or Middle Eastern or uh, Sephardic descent that would be Jews mostly from Yugoslavia, um, old Yugoslavia, doesn't exist anymore, the Balkans in general, where Jews ran away in 1492 when Jews and Muslims were expelled from Spain, and then in 1497 when they were expelled from Portugal. Um, many, many went to the Ottoman Empire where they were welcomed. Um, so if you are, if you are of those heritage of, of Jews, you will eat beans and rice. But if you are from Ashkenazi Jews, Central and Eastern European Jews, you don't. Because that wasn't your staple anyway. They didn't really have beans and rice. In modern times, they eat, you know, they eat potatoes. We love potatoes. Um, there's another not interesting. Then in later in the spring, 50 days later, there's another harvest holiday, the wheat holiday, um, another seven-day holiday. The, the three seven-day holidays, those are days when in, um, in times past, in the times where there was an independent Jewish kingdom um, uh, in Israel, um, there would be the ingathering sacrifices. This was during priestly times we had a temple, there were animal sacrifices. Or you would bring the first fruits, the first animal, or the first grain. And so those are, and of course the holidays had to be seven or eight days long because people had to walk to, to get to Jerusalem. And there's a, uh, you know, I didn't tell you about Hanukkah. You don't know Hanukkah. The, holiday with the lights. Everybody's got, in the fall or the winter, everybody's got some holiday 
where they do sympathetic magic again. You know, they make a lot of light, and they're like, son, see, see, this is what you want to, uh, you know, this is what you want to do, this is what we want you to do. Um, at Planica, we light one candle the first night, and two the second night, and we go all, um, all eight nights, and we're saying, you know, son, see, more and more light, do that, and um, every year it works. So we, we keep doing it. And I, I think I've chattered on for my amount of time. So questions? OK, questions for Rabbi Judy. Hi, my name is Omar Muhammad. Uh, I have a few questions. Sure. Number one is that uh, how do you guys break your fast after 24 or 25 hours? Is there any special, is there any ritual or special? Food? Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm going to stand up again. Um, it's only anything special uh, to break our Yom Kippur fast. Uh, people get together and uh, there is a, a ceremony, not even a ceremony, there's a tradition of eating an egg. Um, but mostly we just get together and eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no particular like religious ceremony or ritual to it. And about how many days do you guys fast in a year? Oh, well, there are two main fasts that are 25-hour fasts. And there are four minor fasts, which are sun up to sundown fasts. So um, not very many times. We like to eat. And uh, regarding the reading or recitation of the Torah, mm -hmm. um, so it's first five chapters of uh, Jewish Bible. Yes. Okay, is it different than a regular Bible that is found? Uh, well, if, you know, for me, this is the regular Bible. Um, it the Christian Bible incorporates the Jewish Bible. They call it the Old Testament. It's in a kind of a different order from us. But if you're you know, looking at a Christian Bible, you will see the same first five books in the same order. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and we don't recite. We never recite. Even if you know it by heart, you always follow along we, um, so as not to seem like you're bragging because you, cause you know it all. What language? Hebrew. Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your questions. Okay, who else has some questions for Rabbi G? Ruth. When I was a little girl, I remember that at a, our Seder, my father always sat on a bunch of pillows rather than you know, sitting up in a chair. And nobody ever explained that to me. Could you? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, during the Seder, the youngest child recites four questions. And one of the questions is, on all other nights, we, I'm translating, on all other nights we eat either sitting up or reclining. And why on this night do we recline? Your father was reclining, and the answer is because when we were slaves in Egypt, we could not rest. We, and so tonight we are able to rest and recline as we eat with our families. So that's why he did it. It's one of the, it's the answer to one of the four questions. Nobody else was lying, just my Yeah, well, mm, <laughs> sorry. We are um, not exempt from the ills of um, patriarchy. Yeah. <laughs> the ills of patriarchy? No, the four questions. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you know what they mean. Oh, yeah. 
um, my first Spencer Hebrew class was a challenge. <laughs> The, the four questions are Manishtana Halalazim Mikul Halalot. Why is this night different from all the other nights? Okay, do it with me. Okay, on all other nights, we eat either chametz or matzah, um, matzah or leavened food. And why on this night do we eat only matzah? On all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables. Sheariyakot. Oh, and on this night, we eat bitter veg bitterness, bitter vegetables. We eat horseradish. We love it. Um, on all other nights, we don't dip our food even one time. Why on this night do we dip it twice? And that refers to the ritual foods that we're eating, and one gets dipped in salt water and like that. And then the reclining one. Did I do good? You did. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, Chris. All right. I'll bring you the microphone. Uh, this is a first for me. I, I've met uh, Jewish people who are cultural Jews. It's the first time I've met a someone. You call yourself a rabbi, but you describe yourself as you're doing your talk as not being religious. So I, I thought yeah, it might be a good opportunity just to elaborate on ah. what you mean by that. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, I call myself a rabbi because I have been or ordained a rabbi. Um, a rabbi is a teacher. A rabbi is somebody who is qualified to teach and to judge. And that's what it says on your, on your ordination certificate, your smicha. It says um, to teach, to teach, to judge, to judge. It's kind of like... Can you teach? Yup. Can you judge? Yup. Um, among religious Jews, the judging has to do mostly with, is, is this chicken kosher or not? Um, is this person a person I can marry or not? Judging about Jewish law. Um, in our tradition, we help you make judgments. We are trained... Um, to help you clarify values and make your own judgments about things. And then the teaching is the teaching. Um, it is only coincidental that rabbis are treated like um, priests or um, ministers. That's a Western, a Western thing, a modern thing. Um, in, uh, in old days, um, Rabbis were actually not allowed to take money for their for uh, being rabbis. They had to have an actual job, and they were rabbis on the side. Oh, I don't believe in any gods, and I don't pretend I do. Thank you. What? Okay. Oh, um, I was asked what it means not to be religious. And I said, what it means is that I don't believe in any gods and I don't pretend that I do. Thank you. Um, and then we'll go to Ruth. Okay. Okay, I got one question. You said there's a day you guys remember of dead people. Yes. Okay. Uh, is that dead people you're talking about in the spirits? The time they were with the family? They're going in here after? What do you mean remembering the dead? Oh. We, we remember because we believe that, you know, immortality is in memory. And that when we remember somebody, we're bringing some part of them forward into our own lives. A lot of times we'll, you know, in my family, um, I just make their favorite meal on their yurt site. Um, uh, I make my grandmother's um, chicken vegetable soup with nobody eats but me. Um, but I'm going to do that because it's my bubber again is yurt site. Um, there is... Um, there is no prescribed way to do this. Sometimes you just talk about the person. When I, for instance, when I do 
a funeral, one of the things that I like to ask people to do is to remember their the favorite thing about the person who's died and to incorporate that into their lives. You know, to to give that um, trait immortality in that way. For, you know, for a while. Um, and so sometimes people talk about that. Sometimes people just light a candle and go on with their lives. There's nothing prescribed about it. Okay, thanks. We have a question back here, and then Ruth, I think you had one more question. And then we'll close the, quote, formal part of the meeting. Yeah. And if people want to stay after that for small group discussions, they can. Okay, question back here. Hi, my Hi. name is Sadia. And I'm going to piggyback on your response to the previous that you said, Rabbi, you're rabbi, but you don't believe in any God. I have heard the term that I'm an atheist Jew. Mm -hmm. Could you please explain what does that mean? It means that you're Jewish and you don't believe in any gods. Because being Jewish is not a religion. It's, um, it is more like being, for instance, Navajo. You can be a Navajo, you can, you can believe in the traditional um, Navajo religion, you can be a Christian, you can be an atheist, but your culture, your ethnicity is still Navajo. And that's the same way with Jews. It's only in the West where we say, you know, Catholic, Protestant, Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, as if it's a religion. Religion is part of our culture, like it's a part of any culture. But so Judaism is not a religion? It's not a religion for sure, because um, Jews don't believe the same thing. We, we're all over the map. Um, the best I can say is that Jews don't believe in more than one God. Um, some believe in one, some believe in none. Um, we all think different things. It's, it's, not, it's not a creedal religion. There's nothing that you must believe in order to be Jewish. It's just something you are. Okay. And Ruth, you have one more question? Yeah. Okay. So, um, as a rabbi, uh, do you hold um, you know, services on a regular basis? Um, we have my community. Yeah, yeah. We uh, we have holiday observances, and uh, about once a month we get together on uh, on Shabbat to light candles, eat challah, drink a little wine, mm -hmm. play a game, sing. Mm -hmm. You know. So so you do a lot of the traditional Jewish uh, rituals, and uh, and and. That, that keeps your community connected to, I don't know, you say Judaism isn't, isn't a religion, but it keeps it connected to the culture. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. got it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's give one more round of applause to our presenters. Thank you very much. And I have just a few announcements I'd like to make. And when I finish making them, then anyone who needs to leave may do so. Well, you could actually leave now if you had to. But um, <laughs> here are my announcements. Um, Interfaith Interconnect will take a vacation in July. So our next religion chat will be August 9th. And we haven't uh, determined for certain the topic or the location. So keep an eye on your email for that. Um, and then in addition to our, two, or our second Wednesday religion chats, we also plan to hold our annual observance of World Day of Peace in September. And we're right now working on dodging the Jewish holidays, if we can, um, so we don't have a conflict. And then we're also going to be collaborating with the Livermore Pleasanton Interfaith Clergy Association for another interfaith Thanksgiving service in November. And it will probably be in Pleasanton this year. Last year it was in Livermore. Um, so stay tuned for information about that. And so we hope to see you all on Wednesday, August 9th, our next religion chat. 
And now if any anyone who would like to stay for informal discussion may do so, I think we have till 8.30, is that right? Okay, great. And thank you again, everybody, for coming. Thank you to our people online.